everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood for April 21st, 2020. Um, this is the, uh, the webinar and podcast of Past to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is bridging bias and building unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And tonight I'm really honored to have with, with me uh, Tom Aketa from Densho. He's the founding executive director of Densho. He's a third generation Japanese American born and raised in Seattle. Tom's parents and grandparents were incarcerated during World War II at Minidoka, Idaho. Um, he's won numerous awards for his community and historical contributions, including Humanities Washington Award for Outstanding Achievement, the National Japanese American of the Biennium Award, a Microsoft Alumni Integral Fellows Award, and many others. And uh, Tom, I'm just I'm just so pleased to talk with you tonight. I've I've spoken with you several times, and I've been looking forward to just sitting down and having coffee and so or tea. And so this is the, a, a great opportunity for us uh, to do that right now over Zoom and have a few friends join us. Um, so first of all, I just want to ask, uh, how are you and your family doing in these uh, COVID-19 days after five or six weeks of, of in-home in -home isolation? Thanks for asking, Terry. Um, and, and, and just before I say that, I just want to let you know how inspired I am by your work. I mean, we haven't really had the chance to sit down and just get to know each other. So, you know, I know people are watching, but I'm just so looking forward to, to doing this. Um, you know, in some ways, um, you ask, you know, how we're doing and, you know, it, it's, it's hard being, you know, in home and uh, not able to be out in the community, seeing people. You know, my, my parents, um, um, you know, thankfully, they're both alive and healthy. They're both 93 years old. But wow. uh, in particular, we're just being very, very cautious. And so to not, you know, not be there, although they just live a couple of miles away and, and not be able to give them a hug. You know, we, when I visit now, you know, I stay outside and we keep, you know, sort of six feet apart and we have conversations outside. But so all those things have, have shifted in terms of, of kind of a, a missing but yet, you know, I, I constantly look for um, the silver linings, you know, the opportunities to, you know, meet and, and talk with different people uh, because of the circumstances. Um, you know, and, and you are following the news too. I mean, and just also being just heartbroken by what's happening in our country. I mean, it's so clear that things aren't working, especially for the poor and vulnerable. And and that's just so, so difficult to see. So it's just this mixture of so much going on. It's very unsettling to, to have to just sit in the house with all these different things happening. Yeah, there is a kind of, uh, of you know, watching the news, reading articles. Uh, there is a, there's definitely a sense of, of watching a, a terrible train wreck taking place and knowing that there's not a lot that any of us can really do about it. And that our the response overall has not been effective uh, to to halt halt the, the the disease and and then to see people of color um, as you as you mentioned um, in, in addition to what you mentioned um, really being impacted by this because of the inequities in our economic and health system um, and so therefore when a crisis like this hits of course that that disparity is amplified even further. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, and in many ways, I think what this crisis has at least shown is it's really kind of uncovered, you know, just really how inequitable our, our country is. And, and what's interesting to me is to actually see it on a global scale, too. I mean, you, you can see other countries, how they're handling it. You know, I've always been, I think, in some ways, like most Americans, you know, sense of this exceptionalism of America and our ability to innovate and do things. And I feel like we've just really dropped the ball this time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, so I, you know, I, I know for myself, you know, some, some, some daily prayer and meditation are important. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to try to help remind myself of the goodness of the moment. Um, but I, I will say that yesterday, you know, I sort of hit the wall a bit in the morning and, I sat down to my chair in the morning and started working and I realized I was anxious. Yeah. And just to be able to share that with, with my staff and with some of the other folk uh, that I spoke to that day was really a gift, but also to take some time and take some deep breaths and do some practices that help me uh, 
kind of realize that, you know, there's a lot of things out of my control, but I can also enjoy, I can also enjoy the moment as well as feel great compassion for what's happening to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that makes sense as I hear you talk because of your work and especially with some of these frontline communities who are being affected. And, um, you know, my, my wife just today was noticing that uh, I was talking about something and, you know, tears just start coming down. And I think there is this sense of, of really feeling it, you know, this, this sense of compassion because you know people personally who are really suffering right now. So, Tom, for the people who don't know much about Densho, um, what, what is the mission of Densho? What do you all do? And so uh, Densho is, um, it comes from the Japanese American uh, community. We're based in Seattle. You know, let me actually turn off one of my, my uh, programs here that's buzzing. And, um, and so we started 25 years ago to preserve the Japanese American story. Our elders who were incarcerated during World War II. And then to share these stories and history to a much larger audience to promote you know, justice and equity uh, today and in the future, that we felt that there was so much to learn from what happened to our elders and their stories, and that you know, it would be, you know, almost for us in the Japanese American community, so much has happened and we know these stories, but we've also been very quiet about a lot of these stories. And what we really want to do was to share, and so our Part of our strategy was to actually do this all online and to make it available. So literally millions of people can, can listen to these stories and learn from, from them. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've, I've been on your website and, and I utilize, you know, some of the photos in, in some of the presentations that I use to sort of take people through, you know, some of what that, of, of what happened. And, and one of the photos that really struck me, well, there were, there were two uh, that, really, that really haunted me, really. One was a funeral service taking place in a camp. Yeah. And the family standing around the casket and in the background was a fence. Mm -hmm. And then and then one that like sort of brought some hope to me, but also was heartbreaking too, was a young couple up in a guard tower. Um when when it had been announced that that, that they could leave. Mm. Oh, you know, surveying where they had where they'd been forced to stay with so many others and um so I, I, I find it instructive and I go there a couple of times a year just to, to help deepen my own understanding. Mm. Yeah, there's a, a photo that I will share with you after. Uh, and um, in the same way, some of these historic photos can mean a lot. And there was one that, it's funny because I'm, I'm viewed in the community as this archivist and, and so many families and institutions have shared these historic photos with me. And it was about 10 years ago. So this was like 15 years into Densho. My mother actually, um, um, we were just alone at, at her house and she said, there's something she wanted to show me. And she brought out this photo album. And in the photo album, there was, and, and your story reminded me, it was a, a picture of, from a memorial service where she was uh, you know, being incarcerated um, with her, her parents. And, um, and the photograph was of my grandparents accepting the American flag at a memorial on this dusty field because um, you know, my mom's you know, oldest brother uh, was killed in action you know, fighting you know, for the US Army in Europe. And you know, she and my grandparents were at the Minidoka concentration camp and that's where they had to accept the flag. And, and it was such a... a, a, a I mean, gut wrenching photograph for me to see, and 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 it just caught me by surprise. But it's it's something that I always go back to in terms of of what my grandparents, what my immigrant grandparents had to go through uh, during that time period. Well, what a what a photo of of the um, juxtaposing the stated values of of the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and the, the lived, uh, the, the, the fact that we don't always live up to those values very well. I mean, that, that's, that is, uh, I, I just, even imagining that is, is breaking my heart right now. Oh, yeah. And, and just, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of on tangents, but the, 
impact of the faith community. There was a, a, a Catholic uh, priest, Father Tibisar, um, who was there at that memorial service. And, and you know, he saw, he saw what happened to my grandparents. And so um, he went out of his way and brought you know, my grandparents and my mom and my uncle back to Seattle. So they were the first family to come back to Seattle. Wow. And part of that was, um, you know, this, this you know, Catholic priest saw what happened. And so the Catholic church, you know, got jobs for my, um, you know, grandparents, uh, you know, enrolled my um, uncle at O'Day, um, you know, high school in Seattle. And uh, wow. my, my uh, mom went to also Catholic school. And so the, 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 due to this, this priest really, really helped um, my family at a time when they were at the lowest. And so the, in, in that case, you know, that, that reaching out, that compassion has meant so much to us as a family. And, and because of that, we know how powerful it is when you help someone, especially when you're outside the community, to actually right. go in there and really help out. Wow. You know, that's so, in, in, you know, we, we often throw these words around, uh, you know, Japanese internment. And I'd, I'd like to know how you describe what happened to Japanese Americans during that time. What is the language you use to describe that? Yeah, great, great question. Because um, the people, when I speak, they, they, they oftentimes notice that I don't, I rarely use the term internment. That, um, and what I usually say, the Japanese American incarceration. And the reason I do that is, um, you know, internment is a, a more technical legal term that was used to round up and uh, you know, give hearings to uh, Japanese nationals, Italian nationals, and German nationals. And this was under the you know, War Powers Act. And it, it's kind of similar to the process that en enemy combatants do when they go to Guantanamo Bay. Um, but there is this sort of legal process. Um, and that happened to several thousand, you know, Japanese uh, men primarily. But after that, um, you know, under executive order, presidential executive order, uh, you know, FDR signed uh, Executive Order 9066, which then started the process where the rest of the community on the West Coast was rounded up. And these were um, predominantly U.S. citizens and people who had uh, done nothing wrong. And in this process, there were no hearings, no trials. Uh, it was based just on their race. And they were then placed in these concentration camps. And, and that's why I, I, I generally call the whole process the Japanese American incarceration, because most people that were impacted were U.S. citizens, and they weren't actually formally interned. And so that's kind of how I, I look at this. And, and so when we talk about the 120,000 Japanese Americans, um, they were in what were called war relocation authority camps, which were not internment camps uh, technically. I see. So when the when the when the when the the the, the rumor of this began to to get around, and when when Japanese Americans, you know, again, American citizens are being notified of this, what was the impact of that, of that uh, news uh, in the Japanese American community? Yeah, so it, it, as you can imagine, there was a sense of abandonment um, that, um, you know, here's a, a story I'll tell. It's one of the first people we interviewed. Uh, her name is Aki Kurose, and people in Seattle will recognize that name because one of uh, our middle schools are named after her. Mm. She was a well-known um, you know, pacifist. But um, she was a sophomore at Garfield High School in Seattle. <clears throat> and she was um, kind of this popular, well-known um, uh, student, had never been to Japan, um, in many cases in the Seattle high schools, you know, Japanese Americans oftentimes were, you know, the you know, really good students, good athletes, top students. Um, and they view themselves when you, I interview them as just these sort of you know, regular American teenagers. Um, and so December 7th happened and, uh, you, know, um, you know, Japan, you know, bombed Pearl Harbor. And again, Aki didn't think that much of it. You know, her parents, you know, told her that, you know, she should be concerned. But Aki said, you know, people like me. And so next day on, on December 8th, she went to Garfield High School. And she went up to one of her favorite teachers. And the teacher, you know, looked at Aki, and, and Aki said in a very different way, and said, you know, your people bombed us. 
And at that point, Anki just felt like, what happened? You know, all of a sudden she went from kind of a, a teacher's pet, you know, someone that was really liked all of a sudden to someone who was being rejected and told that um, you're, you're aligned with the enemy. And so it was, it was that more than anything when I interviewed, you know, the hundreds of, of people that I've done oral histories with, it was this just sense of, of rejection from, from really the only country uh, you know, these men and women knew. And, and so that was the, the most devastating part of what happened in the aftermath of, of, uh, of, you know, Pearl Harbor. And as they heard, um, you know, more and more in terms of being rounded up, you know, there's this disbelief, you know, first it was okay, you know, re being rejected, but then to be rounded up and to be confined was even more of a slap in the face for, for these people. And it must have made it difficult for them, you know, having trusted that the United States would be different, having trusted that the teachers who cared about them, that the friends who cared about them, that the neighbors who cared about them, the fellow business owners who cared about them, the city officials that cared about them, were so quickly to assign collective blame. Yeah. And, and then to begin to act this way. I mean, that, that, that must have had lifelong emotional and relational impact for, the, for these human beings. It, 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 it did. And, 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 yeah, as a historian kind of taking a step back and looking at it too, it also is this powerful statement or understanding of what fear can do to, to communities um, that, you know, World War II, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. You know, there were rumors that there was going to be a West coast invasion but people were terrified and, and, and so there was that fear, and then you you can see how how quickly we can turn against each other, and that I think is is a really powerful lesson for us to know, especially when we are in crises like we are today. Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna I want to come back to that in a little bit because I think I think the way the the virus is being named is 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 potentially extremely dangerous. Uh, but I, but I, I also just want to keep digging in. So what was it like for the Japanese Americans, you know, as they were, what was their experience in terms of like leaving their, their home and, 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 and getting to these, to these uh, incarceration camps? You know, what was interesting to me was the range of, of ideas or thoughts of what's going to happen. I mean, mm. And I think we could feel a little bit of this in terms of the uncertainty. You really don't know what's going to happen. As a historian, we can look back and say, oh, these things happened. And there was kind of this clarity. But when you talk to people who were living it through the moment, um, as they were getting rounded up, uh, they didn't know what was going to happen. So I've interviewed people, and the range of responses go from something like, you know, some people believed um, that, well, this is America. We're U.S. citizens what will probably happen is we'll get, you know, kind of rounded up, brought inland uh, away from the West Coast, and then probably just released and, and just asked to stay off the West Coast. So there are quite a few people who, who had this belief. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, there, there were quite a few people who, who actually believed that uh, when they got on the train, they were going to be taken out into some kind of desert or field and actually execute it. Um, and so there was a sense of that, um, that their lives were going to be ended. And so to me, that's kind of the most interesting thing in terms of there wasn't, uh, for the people who are going through it, there was no homogenous sort of way of thinking about what was going to happen. There was actually this wide range um, in terms of how people um, thought about what was going to happen and how they responded to that. Well, and so once they get to the camp um, after, and most of them, most, most folk were transported on trains. Is that correct? Yeah, most, most, yeah mostly on, on trains, uh, just some buses, but most of it was, was because the locations of these camps were uh, quite a bit farther away from, from uh, where they live. So, you know, trains made the most sense. Yeah, and, and, and were, were they allowed, you know, how were the, how were the conditions on the trains? Well, so the, at, at this point, it's, you know, the, the war efforts going on. And so generally the, the, the transport trains for Japanese Americans 
were kind of World War I era kind of trains that were already obsolete and maybe in storage were sort of pulled out and uh, used. So they were kind of old rickety uh, trains that um, you know, um, oftentimes didn't have heat or anything like that or any of the conveniences that we think of, of trains having now. And so it was generally a very difficult uh, ride. And, and, and as part of that, um, the government had, uh, whenever they came to a populated area, you know, the, um, the blinds had to be pulled so that people wouldn't know that Japanese Americans were being transported in these trains. Um, and so especially uh, those families that had children um, or elderly people, it was, it was a very difficult trek for them. That's fascinating to me. I wonder, what was that? Was it because they didn't want their, the citizens to know that that was happening, or or was it because they didn't want citizens to uh, do any kind of violence toward the train, or or what do you think was behind that? You know, I, I think th th there might be um, both ideas there. I, I you know I think um, you, you know, it's sometimes. Um, when, when I talked to other people um, from that era that were non-Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. the typical response I would get from people, um, especially if they're on the uh, East Coast or Midwest, they said, I, I didn't even know this was happening. And no one really, um, um, we, we just didn't know. I mean, we, we didn't think this was happening. We, you know, if something were, was happening, it was more portrayed as, well, maybe they were prisoners of war. Maybe they were, um, you know, being rounded up from Japan or they were from Japan. And so most people didn't understand. And so a lot of it was just very quiet. I think when you think of your work and what's happening in these various communities, I, I think what most Americans, when you talk to them, they don't know what's going on in our country today. And I think that was more the case. And so when they pulled the blinds, I think part of that was just to keep it, you know, pretty quiet. Well, you know, in, in, the, in the work that I, that I began to feel called to five or six years ago now, um, you know, it, part of it for me was the realization that there were actually hate groups in the country that were well financed, that were using all the modern means of, of communication and technology to instill fear against American Muslims. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so a lot of times when I discuss this with other pastors, who are all people who, like me, when in seminary, learned about what happened to our Jewish neighbors in Germany and vowed to ourselves that if we saw something like that happen, we would not be quiet. I mean, I, I know so many folk in seminary who talked about that. Um, but, but, but literally, many of the, of the faith leaders like, don't, don't know that these kinds of intentional dehumanizing campaigns are taking place. And they would sometimes walk up to me and say, you know, Terry, I mean, I think you're a nice guy, but I think you're kind of, you're, you're being a bit dramatic here. And then I would try to help them understand that, that, these, that these intentional campaigns are actually well-funded. And that even some of the ideas that they have about American Muslims, for instance, come from these hate groups, have been normalized through the media and through politicians. And, and a lot of times when, when, when it finally sinks in that this is an intentional campaign, then people begin to take it seriously and take a different stance. Mm -hmm. It's just easier not to know, you know, and the news media certainly doesn't talk about it that way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. So you've already shared, I think, a really powerful story about, you know, a, a story that happened in the camp about the presentation of the flag. But I wonder if there is another story or two that you might share with us that helps us understand, get a, a, a a feeling for daily life, but also for the emotional and spiritual impact of of the incarceration of Japanese Americans. Yeah, there's there's one story that, that comes to mind, and and this was um, at the beginning of the project. I mean, part of um, for people who do oral histories, um, you know, generally the way it was done is you know people had a a tape recorder. And it was just usually an auto recording, audio recording, and um, in the mid-90s, when we started the project, we toyed around with the idea of video recording these oral histories, and uh, which was, at that time, a very novel idea. And, and so we, we kind of stuck our necks out. A lot of oral historians you know, said, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. And, and so there was one interview in particular that, when I watched it, it confirmed that 
you know, doing video recording was, was, uh, was worthwhile. And uh, so this, the story that I'm going to tell is, is actually about a high school teacher of mine. Uh, his name was uh, Frank Shobo Fuji. And I, I graduated from Franklin High School in Seattle. And uh, Frank was the, um, you know, the art teacher um, and also the, uh, the basketball coach, head basketball coach for the school. And, and the students all looked to Frank as this incredible storyteller, fun guy, uh, kind of a hip guy. Um, you know, the teacher that we would, um, you know, when the, when the school day's over, we'd kind of hang out in his room because, you know, he, uh, he was just had that great vibe. And, um, and generally, he would always tell a story with a funny punchline or joke to uh, make a point or whatever, especially when someone was struggling. So that was someone I, I grew up and knew and, and I thought knew pretty well. And so when we, we did then show, we were doing oral histories and we interviewed you know, Frank, uh, who was, um, he was about 12 or 13 when the war broke out. And so he was uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of an adolescent and his father was a community leader. So on December 8th, the FBI came and removed his father and brought him to a Department of Justice camp. And so the um, you know, family had to fend for themselves without their father. And uh, uh, Frank and his mother and his siblings went to the Tule Lake concentration camp in California. And his dad was at uh, you know, Santa Fe uh, Department of Justice. And so they were separated for about four years. Um, and towards the end of the war, uh, and Frank's talking about this, they get word that their father is going to be um, you know, released from the Department of Justice camp and reunited with the family. And Frank is, is, is telling the stories, oh, this is so exciting. You know, dad's coming back, he said, and, and uh, he's waiting at the fence, you know, uh, you know at the gate. And uh, when he comes, you know, he, he brings the, uh, picks up his uh, luggage and they bring it to the, uh, you know, the family barrack. And in the family barrack, the uh, family's all there waiting with friends, you know, because they're all so excited to see, you know, Frank's uh, father. And, uh, you know, Frank's, um, you know, father is, you know, a little tired and, you know, he's lost a lot of weight, uh, but he's really, you know, glad to see everyone. And so he goes around and Frank's telling the story. So he sees so-and-so and, and it's, oh, how are you doing? And it's great. And, and, uh, and he's you know, smiling and laughing and goes around the room. And then he comes to, you know, Frank, you know, Frank's the next person, you know, his son. And he looks at Frank and, and the, the dad looks at him and says, so, so who's this boy? I don't recognize him. And, and Frank, when he said that, you know, I still remember it because this is that power, power of the video. You could see his face just drop and, and tears come to his eyes. And so for me, that was, you know, that moment when I just knew how powerful these stories could be and how important it was to actually see that expression. Wow. And, and Frank talked about how, you know, there, and I remember I could hear him say this. He said, you know, when you, we went to camp, you know, sure, we lost a lot of things. You know, the, you know we lost our house. We lost a lot of of personal items, material things. But he says the thing that really hurt the most was, you know, that loss with his father, that, you know, he didn't recognize him, that, you know, Frank had, you know, gone from 12 to about 16. So he said, you know, I grew like six inches, my features changed. So yeah, he changed quite a bit, but that his father, you know, wasn't there for that. And, and Frank would say, so that's really for him, the impact of of camp. It was the loss of family at a really critical time for him. And, uh, and he said how lost he felt after that. He just really, um, you know, said his path was one that, you know, esteem issues and, and getting in trouble because he just felt like he was lost at that point. Um, so that's kind of a story that um, sometimes we, we think about the physical hardships, but, but the ones that really I think are the most moving to me are those emotional, psychological losses that people have. That is such a powerful story and that I just want <clears throat> to let just sit there without any further comment. That is so moving, Tom. Um, and I think we can all feel compassion for him. And, and also for, I think about the dad too, in that situation, the moment he realized how, 
how his own disorientation and tiredness and the four years of incarceration at a different camp then impacted his son. Yeah. I'm sure that he, 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 he saw the, the, the change in his son's face that saw the face uh, respond to that situation. And I'm sure that dad carried that yeah. the rest of his life too. Man, so how how did the Japanese uh, Americans begin to you know once they were released? Um, I know that 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 uh, that many did not were not able to to get back to their homes or their businesses. Uh, what was recovery, if you can call it that, like for people? Mm. That's a, a, another you know great question because um, when I first started learning about what happened to Japanese Americans, you know, I read books and history books, textbooks. And, um, and generally, they would portray it as a certain way. Um, as I started going into the stories, um, um, especially around the Pacific Northwest, you, you start seeing how different um, things like the recovery are uh, or were for people. And a lot of it depended not just internally in terms of the community and, and how they thought about things, but oftentimes how the community su supported them. So here's here's the uh, uh, the example. <clears throat> so uh, in Seattle, um, uh, back during World War II, the era where we got our strawberries were primarily from Bainbridge Island or Bellevue. They were you know two kind of uh, uh, areas where um, a lot of strawberries were were grown, and oftentimes by Japanese American farmers. And the reason for that was that in both Bellevue and Bainbridge Island. Um, you know, there's a lot of timber, uh, a lot of old growth timber. They were cut down, but the stumps were always left there. And so it wasn't until Japanese American immigrants came and start clearing the land. They would get these five year leases, clear the land and have a few years to, to plant strawberries. The lease would then end and they would have to go to the next plot and they would do this in five acre plots. It was a really difficult time. And so the, from a agricultural economic standpoint, Bellevue and Bainbridge Island were, were similar, but the experiences of Japanese Americans were, were very different. Um, in Bainbridge Island in, in, in particular, there was a newspaper uh, publisher and, and editor, uh, Walt Woodward. He was um, the owner of the Bainbridge Island Review. And you know, he knew the Japanese American community. And when the bombing of Pearl Harbor happened, you know, he cautioned his readers, like, you know, we know these people, uh, let's not jump to conclusions, you know, let's remember that they're still our neighbors and friends. And, and as Japanese Americans were uh, being removed, uh, Walt would stay in contact with them, write stories about them. He even had Japanese Americans who went to the camps to become uh, writers and columnists to write so that he would then put their stories in the Bainbridge Island Review so that people would be connected. Um, and so there was this, this sense, and, and Walt had done this, you know, for years before World War II. And so there was a sense in that community that, um, that a uh, more cooperative. So when the Japanese Americans left, um, oftentimes their field hands that were either Filipino or indigenous, you know, the Native American, you know, oftentimes they took over the farms and they kept farming it. Um, and then when Japanese Americans returned, they found their farms in pretty good shape. And the beautiful thing that we hear are stories are Japanese farmers who would then give parts of their farm, you know, to these, these people who, who, you know, watch their farms and their property. And uh, so there is this very cooperative, beautiful relationship. Um, later on, if you go to Bainbridge Island today, there's this powerful memorial, um, federal memorial um, on Bainbridge Island. There were schools named after Japanese Americans because Japanese farmers donated lands for schools and things like that. So there was this story of the recovery for the most part went really well in Bainbridge Island. In, in contrast, I talked about Bellevue. And in Bellevue, there was an individual, uh, his name was Miller Freeman. Um, and he was a powerful uh, founder of modern Bellevue. Uh, he was the proponent a key proponent of the floating bridge from Seattle to um, Mercer Island, then to Bellevue, and, and got that placed in there. And 
Um, he was also one of the strongest anti-Japanese advocates. And you talked about earlier about um, the power of media. So he owned uh, you know, newspapers, uh, uh, newsletters, and with a very strong anti-Japanese uh, bent. And it, in that case, um, uh, you know, Miller Freeman constantly advocated for the removal of, of Japanese, even before World War II. And then during World War II, um, he um, started another group that pretty much tried to keep Japanese away from Bellevue. And in that case, um, the, the recovery was very difficult. Most, almost all Japanese Americans did not return to Bellevue. And so um, it was very difficult. And today, when I think about recovery, that we're almost 80 years after the fact, um, there was a recent incident uh, just, just a couple of months ago uh, at Bellevue College where uh, there was an art display that um, talked a little bit about the history of, of Japanese Americans in Bellevue. And in it, in, and it's just kind of a, a sentence or two, they mentioned Miller Freeman and, his, and the difficulties that the Japanese American um, you know, community had with him. And what was interesting was uh, someone um, at Bellevue College on staff with whiteout, he sort of erased that and, and took out uh, so that people could not read Miller Freeman's name. And, and so here's a case where um, rather than being proud of their history and, and how they treat Japanese Americans, it was actually being hidden um, in Bellevue. And as you can imagine, when it you know, happened, when people found out, it caused a big ruckus. Eventually the, the Bellevue College uh, president and uh, a vice president in charge of fund development actually resigned from the uh, college because of this. So there's still this, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you don't um, reconcile some of these things that they keep coming back to haunt you. And the amazing thing to me was that here are just two suburb communities of Seattle with just such different histories and, uh, and so that gives you a sense of, again, the range of recovery where one could be where a community is welcoming and people can thrive and get back and going versus one where it can be very contentious and, and difficult for a community. It's so difficult for human beings, isn't it, to believe that our past actions are not ideal, that our parents' behaviors or grandparents' behaviors or communities' behaviors are not ideal. And then there's also in that lack of, of willingness to, to confess a mistake, you know, a terrible one, um, there's a lack of trust in the community that's been wronged, you know, to, to be willing to, to offer after recompense has been, after restitution has been made, you know, for there to be a kind of, a kind of forgiveness uh, that can then heal the community. That's very difficult for human beings to do. Mm -hmm. And yet that's kind of a, a success story of America. I, I think I mentioned earlier about the, I, I, I talk about sometimes the exceptionalism of America. And, you know, the United States, and, and to their credit, the U.S. government did this remarkable thing in the 80s where they um, opened up the, what happened, the history, and said, um, you know, the Japanese American community feels like they were wronged, so let's actually take a look at this. And they uh, created the commission, uh, and uh, they did a lot of, you know, research over years, and presented to Congress. And Congress agreed with it. You know that um, that uh, the Japanese American community was wronged. Uh, President Ronald Reagan signed uh, the um, the you know this the redress bill, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, and offered an apology and restitution to Japanese Americans. That was that was. Un very unusual for the United States. And you're, you're right, it's so, so hard. I think we need to start, we need to look at that for things like African Americans and, and slavery. And I'm not proposing necessarily that they get reparations or I'm not sure what the solution is, but to have that conversation, to really bring the, the parties together, to really open up and, and to be as open and compassionate as we can, because we keep coming back. We we all know the the systemic historic racism of our of our country, and it feels like you know some of these really deep wounds have to be healed, and and they won't happen until we have these these conversations.
I, I totally agree with all of that. And I, it, it must be, it must have been so weird then to, to see when the Supreme Court upheld the Muslim ban, mm -hmm. that they took that very moment of basically, you know, basically doing the same thing the Korematsu decision did in upholding the U.S. government's right to, to put Japanese Americans in, in, in incarceration. Uh, to then to then apologize and, and rescind that decision while upholding the very same kind of logic uh, in 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 upholding the Muslim ban. Like, what was that like for you and for other Japanese Americans? Yeah. So yeah, just a, a little background. So the Korematsu case, uh, a case of Fred Korematsu, where he challenged the uh, the government's orders to put Japanese Americans in camps. His case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and the court ruled six to three in favor of the government, saying that in times of war, um, um, uh, the government said that there was a military necessity. And in times of war, uh, we have to give deference to the government to make these decisions. So with a six to three ruling, the Supreme Court upheld Korematsu. The, the moment they did that, legal scholars uh, raised red flags. They said, this really goes against the Constitution. This is uh, uh, something that they don't agree with. I think there were legal scholars literally months after in some of the legal journals, you know, challenging it. And, and over time, Korematsu has been viewed as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions uh, you know, made. And so that's always been out there. It's been a sore spot for, for um, uh, Japanese Americans. And then as you mentioned uh, recently, more recently, about two years ago, the Supreme Court ruled on the Muslim travel ban. And this is where there were um, um, a, a ban on travel and immigration from predominantly Muslim uh, countries. And from a Japanese American pr perspective, there were so many similarities between the cases of Korematsu and the, the travel ban. And right. that um, um, in, in, in the case of both of them, the government was claiming military necessity or national security as a reason but it was like this thinly veiled facade behind discrimination. Um, and so two years ago, um, you know, the, uh, the ruling came out and, and Chief Justice Roberts um, actually in his decision, you know, to his credit, repudiated Korematsu. He says Korematsu was this horrible decision that we all know was racist and, and that's not who we are. And, um, but then right after he said that, he said, um, but what we're doing with Muslims is very different. And th this is where I would you know, beg to differ with Chief Justice um, Roberts, where he said they were different. Um, he didn't really get that in 1942, um, the government actually used national security for the reason, not dis discrimination. And they're doing the same thing with the Muslims. So, so that's you know the the similarities. It was really hard. You know, I, I actually brought up a a a picture that uh, and, and Terry, I think this might have been the first time we uh, uh, let me see share screen. Maybe this, oh, maybe it's not working under this right now. Anyway, there's a picture of us. Oh, here it goes. So he, this is actually, I think, the day after the uh, the ruling. And and, yes. and and Terry, you're you're up here. If you see my my yeah. uh, sir, and and it, it was such a, a powerful event for uh, I think for all of us yes. to be on the courts of the Kenzo Nakamura Federal Courthouse, yes. uh, a Japanese American who was incarcerated, who later on uh, fought for the. Uh, Yes. Um, the, the U.S. Army. He actually was killed in action um, about the same time as my uncle that I talked about earlier. Yes. Because the memorial service that I, I mentioned was also a memorial service for Kenzo Nakamura. Wow. Um, and, uh, and here we are, um, you know, on the steps. And here I am, you know, talking about, you know, the, um, the similarities between Korematsu and yes. the Taliban and how wrong that was. But the, the beauty of this, of, this, um, of this event was how quickly the faith community and others came together uh, in support of uh, Anila, who's in the lower right-hand corner. She's you know, uh, you know, sort of off, 
almost off screen, but uh, and the other you know Muslims uh, who we had um, you know known and and supported, and so this was a, an opportunity for us to to come and show our support. And I think the other thing I, I mentioned um, as I was speaking is it was so important for us to be there because you know, 79 years ago when uh, Japanese Americans were being rounded up, uh, there were no allies uh, for right. the Japanese American community. Yes. And today we have the opportunity to be the allies that Japanese Americans didn't have so that these same things don't happen again. Amen. Well, you know, when I, I, I've told you before that I, when I go to, to churches or um, especially to churches, I, who, who often, you know, repudiate, you know, uh, you know, and, and rightly so uh, what happened in Germany toward our German and our German American or German um, Jewish uh, folk and, and the Roma and GLBTQ folk, et cetera. And, uh, and they say that we would never be a part of that. And I, I always bring up, um, I always ask them, well, if your congregation was around uh, during, um, during uh, Japanese internment, um, did, did your community speak out about it? And of course, you know, they, they have no memory of speaking out about it because I don't think they did. And, and so that, that sort of brings it home. And I, I tell them the story that you shared with me, with me once, that, that Japanese Americans did have a lot of allies in Hawaii, Right. And, and so, and, and those allies made it very clear to their leaders and to the military officials that Japanese internment was not going to happen there because, because the Japanese Americans had people willing to stand up and, and go to bat for them. And, uh, and, and what I tell those congregations is that, that, that now you have another opportunity, whether it's standing with Muslims, whether it's standing with Lat Lat Latinx uh, folk, with any other marginalized community, like you have an opportunity now to not make the same mistake mm -hmm. and to actually, and, and, and doing so, it doesn't have to take over everything you do. It has to become a part of what you do. And, uh, and it's, it's been, and so I just want to thank you for that story in helping uh, to clarify for, for folk out there um, what, what they're able to do when they simply stand up and stand with communities that are coming under pressure. Well, and, and Terry, that's why I admire your work so much, because, you know, as a historian, I, I really see the difference individuals make. I mean, you know, we're, we're in a crisis now. I mean, you know, World War II was this huge crisis, and, and these things happen. But what really defines us as a, you know, people, as communities, as individuals, is how we respond to these. And, you know, I, earlier I, I talked about the, the Bellevue, Bainbridge Island differences. Yeah. We're, you know, we're very different, but but because of these two men and how they responded, very different outcomes. Um, you know, you talked about yeah, Hawaii. I mean, there were 160,000 Japanese Americans in Hawaii, so it was larger than the West Coast, and they're in the middle of the Pacific, where you know we're at war with Japan, and because of of this understanding, this allies, um, that it made a, a huge difference. So. That gives me so much uh, inspiration to do the work that we do because, you know, if it didn't matter and we just, you know, kept hitting our heads against a the wall, then it would be so hard to do this. But we know that it does make a difference and we know it's slow and sometimes it feels like we're hitting our heads against the wall, but we can see that it does, it can make a difference. Yeah, and, and Tom, as you as I maybe ask you to, to stop the screen share there for a second, I want to let people know that if they have any questions for Tom, you can hit that little Q and A button if you're watching on Zoom, and and we'll be happy to to share your questions, your your questions there. Um, yeah, Tom, I, I I think that we often overestimate how much it takes to really make a difference and sort of blunt the the impact of dehumanization, and I'm I'm thinking right now. Um, you know about our our Chinese American neighbors. Mm. You know we know that that COVID nineteen you know seemed to originate you know in in China. That's where it first hit, um, and we've seen uh, our, our president and other um, you know folk in the media as well, uh, sort of trying to to blame all Chinese people universally uh, for a disease which impacts all human beings you know equally. Um, what do you think is the is the danger of that in your experience? 
Yeah, you, you, yeah, it's, it's such a, you know, important concept for us to, to recognize. And, you know, earlier we mentioned about how, you know, when um, you, we are in a crisis and there's a lot of fear, you know, people respond differently. And one response that, you know, we see over and over again historically is this, you know, fear and the avoidance of blame. You know, when, when people are in situations, they're looking for someone to blame, to either make sense of it or to take the spotlight off of them or, or whatever. And so this concept of, of what I call scapegoating, where you um, uh, scapegoat that you blame uh, you know, a group for something they, they're not responsible for. And, and part of scapegoating, it, it can be very um, um, subtle in many ways. I mean, something as simple as, as naming the virus, either the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, you know, you start associating this, this horrible, terrible uh, virus with a particular region or people. Yes. And, and, and I know people say, oh, but it's just a name and you shouldn't do this. But the reality is um, the, there's been this incredible spike of, of hate crimes against Asian Americans. Yes. Um, you know, you have Chinese and I, I've seen these horrendous things where, um, you know, a, a, a Chinese American woman in, in, uh, on the East Coast, I think in, in the state of New York, you know, she's emptying her, her trash and, and someone comes up with acid and throws it on her face. Um, and, and with that are these, you know, racial epithets in terms of, of, you know, go back to China or, you know, you're, it's because of you. So, so we know that that happens. And, and so, you know, what we're trying to do is to bring this up as early as possible. You know, our, our, our friends who do Holocaust training, our Jewish friends oftentimes, you know, they talk about genocide, but then how there are these many steps um, that happen before genocide. And yes. one of them is the scapegoating that happens where you, you, you start talking about a group as something as being different and, and something insidious about them, something wrong about them or dangerous about them. And you start associating with this so that you start uh, dehumanizing them in a way that all of a sudden you can start doing um, bad things against them. And the earlier we recognize and try to stop that, the easier it is because by the time you get to genocide, it's, it's, it's just like, it's so difficult that, you know, these things are, are happening. So, you know, your work, um, you know, to, uh, you know, fight Islamophobia and all this now is just as, as critical as, as it can be. And, and not only that, but you know, we have um, immigrants coming up from the Southern border and how they're also demonized. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's just so heart wrenching to see this because we know better. We just, we really know better. And it just keeps happening over and over again. Well, I think there's, this is such a complex, you know, process here. Um, um, it, it's, it, so part of it is that human beings tend not to encounter or emotionally accept our vulnerability um, in, in, in every way. Um, we tend to push it down and push it aside. And so when all of a sudden a vulnerability, when we feel threatened, we're not just threatened by the event or by the virus or by whatever. It's sort of like we're being reminded that we're vulnerable in that moment. And so the, the, the reason that this is so powerful to, to name it after a region or after, after a people is because then we associate the very fact of our vulnerability, of our mortality with that group. It's as if they invented death. And, and then the power of that, then to, to focus that rage on them is really powerful. The other piece that, I, that I've really been struck by is a, a, a writer named Jonathan Leader Maynard, who, who talks about this process of de dehumanization. He calls it dangerous speech that leads to mass violence. Mm -hmm. And what he says about it is that, um, the, that what happens to populations who go along with this isn't that they sit around and think, oh, gee, who can we hurt today? What happens is that leadership begins to persuade them that it is morally right, and in fact, e perhaps even inevitable, that we that, that the society or the government does violence against this group, and that that violence is the only way toward a, a kind of peace that everyone desires. Mm 
that it's heroic and morally right to do it. And, and when, when I read that for the first time, I, I, I really was, my whole thinking shifted from thinking about just a few people who intended wrong to a mass of people who believed that wrong was right. And, and in your writing, I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned this earlier, and there are people who are intentionally in a very sophisticated way trying to, to do this or are doing this. I mean, that's, that's part of this whole process. Yes. Yes. And so what Jonathan Leader Maynard basically says is that, is that a leader or someone in, in influence uh, begins to propose an us and a them, that, 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 there's, that, that they are a threat, that, there's, uh, that they are a, um, that they're collectively to blame for the acts of any one person, and begins then a dehumanization process of comparing these, uh, a certain group uh, to animals or to a threatening kind of situation, and then proposing that this, there's this heroic uh, victory that we can have if we just act now, if we do violence against the group, and that this beautiful future awaits if we just get out there and do it, or, or be silent in the face of it happening. And that process, it's very much similar to what the ADL teaches. It's a very similar kind of progression. Um, but I, I, I think it, it fits very well with what's being cooked up against our, our Chinese American neighbors right now. And I guess one of the questions from the Q&A is, you know, Tom, what do you, what do you think we can do uh, to educate the public and our friends and to push back against this victimizing of Chinese Americans today? You know, something that has been very powerful as I work with uh, other communities, um, you know, whether you know, earlier it was with the Muslim community and, and more recently a lot more with uh, the refugee immigrant uh, community. It, it, it's so, I mean, what we have to recognize, and I, and I really get this from a, a, a Japanese American uh, community history, you know, when you're the group on the front line being targeted and being barraged with, um, you know, all this negative energy, um, you know, being, you know, um, you know, everyone being told that you're dangerous. It's, it's really hard to navigate that um, in ways that um, you can also convince other people. You're, you're just really, what I, I see was, you're in survival mode. You're just trying to get through. And so what, what we can do, especially, and we, you know, we, at Denshi, we call it upstanders, or, you know, that uh, oftentimes you, are observing this happening and for people outside of those target communities to you know, be educated to to recognize you know some of the things we're talking about about you know whether it's a pyramid of hate or or you know this intentional otherizing and, and uh, uh, making these groups you know seem dangerous so that you can you know hurt them or whatever for us to understand that and, and then to reach out and 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 stand with these communities and, and to do it, and we, we talked a little bit about this before we went on camera, and to do it in such a, a sensitive, respectful way too. You know, we're not saviors. We're not, you know, we don't have the, the, uh, the, the ideas or solutions to help these communities. But we, we can go there and ask them how we can help and, and to be committed to really helping them in the ways that are beneficial or helpful to them and not what we think should happen um, is something that, you know, I've, I've had to learn uh, because oftentimes I bring this historian hat. Well, the Japanese American community, we saw this and, and this was a problem. And so I think if you do this, you'll avoid this. But it's, I've, I've realized that I, I just need to go in and listen. So in terms of the question, you know, you know, being aware of what's going on, I think that some of the things we've talked about today and, and reaching out in ways that, um, that, these communities know that they're being heard and and they'll tell you what what uh what we can do to help them you know i think uh what i what i've learned uh from my muslim neighbors um is that it's important to to stand up and it's important to stand up in public and of course that's a little bit hard right now but we have facebook and twitter and instagram and we can say you know chinese american you know chinese americans uh, you know, do not deserve to be treated this way, and they do all these positive things. Um, part of it is is to tell a positive story about your Chinese American neighbors, um, and sometimes the power of that simple story uh, can can really 
can really change things, can help people, you know, like, uh, like Matt Woodward, you know, to share those positive stories. But what he also did uh, in his leadership on Bainbridge was he created space for Japanese American voices yeah. to continue to be represented in the community, even while they were being incarcerated unfairly. And I think so part of my job it has been to create space for American Muslims to be able to, uh, to be heard. And I use my white male cisgender pastor wearing a collar and a suit privilege to create that space. Mm -hmm. And then it's my job to get out of the way and to learn when to speak, when to be quiet, when to support, and when to lead. And, and so a lot of times, you know, when Muslim speakers are asked the question, the Muslim speaker will respond to the question, but I will then respond to the bigotry behind it or the bias behind it um, and, and, and journey with people as they recognize their own bigotry because I've had to recognize my own. Mm -hmm. um, it has been one of the most beautiful things to do this work, but it's also been immensely painful yeah. is to realize you know, how many times uh, I on the stage or in front of a class have said something that disadvantaged my Muslim neighbors. And so part of it is listening and being open to learning how you can be more, how we can be more, um, uh, be better allies. Uh, but to know that the people who need, who need the space right then in that moment um, are of course, is of course the group that's under pressure. Yeah, yeah. So well said, Terry, that's beautiful, thank you. Well, Tom, I, I just want to say I, I, I would love to keep going for a long time. I, there, there is a thank you up here. Um, there, uh, Stacy and Jeremy are, are saying that uh, I, I'm a Chinese American mom. I too think it's important for us to have a voice in this situation and to have support from people and friends of all races. And, and I, I would like to, to bring on a Chinese American voice uh, leader here soon. If anybody there out there knows anybody that I could bring on to talk about the situation, um, I would really be happy to do that. Um, so, Tom, I, I, I would be happy to talk for another hour, but, but we kind of talked about, about speaking for, for an hour or so, and I'm just so grateful to you for being on with me tonight. I learn so much every time that I, I listen to you, and more than just the words you say. Um, there's, a, there's a real wisdom in you from hearing all these stories. And... Um, and uh, I just really appreciate the work you do. Well, Terry, and, and likewise, I just so appreciate what you do and, and, and allowing or creating this space for me and others to do this is, is so important. So th thank you so much. You're welcome, Tom. Thank you. And so we just want to let you all know that next week we're going to have Anthony Young, who's the first African-American city council person in Anacortes, uh, Amy Hong and Keiko McCracken, and we'll be talking together about uh, some of the issues about race in small towns in Washington State. You can find out more about uh, our work at PathToUnderstanding.org. We're currently having our spring fundraiser, so you can certainly contribute if you wish to do so. We also want to remind you about Challenge 2.0, which is a, a half-hour TV show hosted by Jeff Renner. It's on MeTV on Sunday mornings at 7.30 or on our YouTube channel, Path to Understanding. Just look that up on YouTube. We also are, are still engaging in our Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. You can find out more about that at factsoverfear.org. And I just wanna, wanna encourage you to be well, to be calm, and to be really good to your neighbors. Thank you all for listening.